Hey guys, EST here, and I'm going to show you how to run your refrigerator off of a backup battery in case of an extended power outage. And as always with this channel, it's going to be as cheap as possible without compromising reliability or safety. So the first thing you need to know is how much electricity does it draw? And you've got four options. One, one of these nice labels on the back should have the uh, electrical rating in either watts or amps. And if it's amps, you just multiply it by 120 to get the total watts. And then buy a sufficient inverter. Now, number two, you could look it up online. Uh, I at least found the model number of this one. Looked it up online, couldn't find it. That was really weird, actually. Number three, you could just meter it. I uh, don't know if you heard in that last clip, but it just turned off. But uh, if it were to kick on, you could just open the door until it turns on. Um, this one would be 131 watts, it turns out. Or your fourth option is to just buy an 800 to 1000 watt inverter because there is no residential refrigerator that I'm aware of that runs above 750 watts. Now, I mentioned inverters. There's so many out there, and a lot of them are terrible. Which one do you buy? Well, one, a sufficient size for the amount of watts being pulled through it, and two, one that's reliable. But first of all, what do they do? Well, they take 12-volt uh, direct current, or in some cases, 24, but you'd want to run it on 12, and they turn it into 120 volts alternating current. So this one right here is a 2,000-watt Jupiter. It's a Harbor Freight one. They make ones that are like 800 to 1,000. They're very, very cheap. But for not much more, you can get one that's infinitely better. They're very inefficient. They're loud. I don't like them, and I don't think they're very reliable. I've already had one break, so I'm not a fan. Now, this is the opposite. 3,000 watts capable. It's about 650 bucks retail. On the used market, they're like 450. Complete overkill, but it's for, like, van life and RV stuff. So I purposely wired this one up wrong. We bought a little battery hookup kit. Look at that. You got uh, the voltage test points. Isn't that nice? Nice uh, solid lead on there. You know, pretty good. Kind of thin gauge cable. You want to go at least four, depending upon the uh, uh, distance that you're going here. But I mean, to pull 130 watts to power a fridge, yeah, you don't need that, that thick a cable. The problem is, uh, what if something goes wrong and it starts melting? How quickly could you get this or that off? And the answer is, you can't. So never just go direct to the battery. That is so dangerous. So speaking of batteries, this one right here is a lead acid. It's a deep cycle marine battery, which is very important. That is the type you want, not just a random car battery. And these don't really cost that much more. This is a pretty top of the line FVP one. And I only paid about 110 bucks for it at the hardware store. So a deep cycle marine one, it's designed to output a steady amount of, of output current for a long time and then fall off voltage wise really close to uh, when it runs out of capacity. Now lithium is way better at that, but the only advantage is that it weighs less. Uh, that's that's about it. Otherwise, you're going to pay three to six times more for the equivalent in output current and capacity. So I'm not a big fan of lithium unless it's like a permanent solar install and you're going to use it every day. Then I would 100% not go lead acid. The only disadvantage to this is really the weight. And long-term wear and tear, obviously, but uh, we're not really worried about that for this project. So how do you wire it up safely? Well, you need a way to quickly disconnect it. Because if I were to just bolt this straight onto there, it's going to take a while to take that off. And if this is on fire and melting and smoking, that's not the amount of time you want to take. So uh, they do sell these. Uh, this actually came with one of them. Um, it's a little thin. That looks like 8 gauge. That's kind of frightening, even for a one-foot run. But um, yeah, I mean, hey, this will quick disconnect. You just... There you go. If you want to get a little fancier, we got this guy right here. This fits on the terminal. Um, take my word for it. <laughs> and uh, uh, You just move to the terminal next to it so you can still use the terminal hookup. And then, uh, boom, now it's off. Now it's on. There you go. I think this is capable of uh, carrying 2,000 watts or something like that. Uh, yeah, not bad. Just keep in mind, I really wouldn't want to lift this with my hand in case something was on fire and melting. Uh, or in case this was really, really, really hot. So, um... I'd keep like a wooden ruler, a stick, or a wooden spoon or something next to it just so that you could trip it without having to get in there and burn your hands. If you saw my last video, burning your hands is a distinct possibility. And then there's the cheapest option, and I don't really see much wrong with this. Uh, you know, just put it on there. Little clamp, $1.50, quick disconnect. There you go. Can't really beat that. Since these are flat and these are round, I don't love it, but uh, there are ones with uh, different style terminals that are flat and uh, you get a little better surface area there. Oh, I should of course mention that the quick disconnect should always be on the positive because uh, that would be the part that's shorting out. If you uh, disconnect the ground, but you're shorting from positive to ground elsewhere, that's not gonna help you much. So the last component you need, and yes, I did use the word need correctly. This is not optional, trust me. 
Um, you might think, oh, but quick disconnect. Yeah, well, while you're sleeping, while you're outside, while you're not watching it, you're going to sit there and just pull up a chair and stare at this thing? No, you need something that'll break the circuit if something goes wrong while it's unattended. Very, very, very important. You might think nothing will ever go wrong, but this is a lot of juice sitting here. And when something goes wrong, it'll go really wrong. So this right here is a pretty expensive fuse holder because it's uh, commercial. I mean, you can get cheaper ones than this. Um, that fuse cost me a pretty penny, I'll tell you that. But I bought it from a respectable place. It's 200 amps because uh, it would cut off at, let's see, 12 volts, uh, 200 amps, 2,400 watts. If it's pulling 2,400 watts on a 130-watt load, you got a problem. Bolted her in. We've got a little uh, rubber grommet on here to make it waterproof, which is completely unnecessary. This is uh, technically an automotive system, but you would just uh, clamp it right there, clamp it right there, put some washers on it, and call it a day. If you want to go a little cheaper, you can get a car audio one. They have ones that just kind of take bare wire, screw it in, they pressurize it on each side, and then you've got like a thin fuse on the middle. Uh, those are pretty effective. You can get a pretty cheap one and it'll still work pretty well. So as far as wiring, um, this is kind of thin, but I'm just using it as a short little jumper and the tips are already made because this is a, a battery wire. I think it's rated for like 2000 watts or something. So, um, you know, not really the weakest link, but this is what's going to go to the fuse. So you're going to need a really short cut to go to the fuse, preferably less than 18 inches. And then um, if you just get bare wire, that's probably the cheapest way to do it and put your own tip on it. Somebody else did this one, by the way, but you can see they use heat shrink. So uh, that's pretty much uh, this stuff right here. There we go. And uh, make sure it's wide enough for the gauge of wire that you're buying. But you can buy this stuff just from the foot. So you can see it's a uh, two gauge, which is not playing around. 300 amp capable. Very, very, very nice. Uh, especially if you have a 200 amp fuse. Because then that will burn before this does. And then just buy as few feet as this as you possibly can get away with. So measure ahead of time. You know, get out the kite string or whatever you want to do. And uh, make it as short as possible because you want the lowest voltage drop and the lowest resistance. So that means don't send it very far. Now, if you're not comfortable putting the tip on yourself, uh, it's not really that hard, but finding ones that are sufficient gauge is really actually hard. This is for two gauge cable. Um, pretty nice, you know, kind of like a copper mix. I like it. Otherwise, you know, the cheapy ones, nothing wrong with this. Uh, four gauge though. Um, yeah, you could get away with four gauge. Uh, you can look up a chart. In fact, I'll probably just throw it up on screen right now. Uh, that tells you like what length of cable versus the amount you're pulling through it is safe before it will start getting to an alarming temperature, which is not what you want. But uh, I will warn you that there is a very specific crimping tool to put these on correctly. I don't own one and I don't use it. I just pretty much uh, smash it with a hammer, maybe put like a like a flat head on it to kind of imitate what it's doing, but it's, it's not the ideal way to do it. You want to kind of press into it in like a, a really particular shape. So if you can find one that's pre-done for you, not a bad idea. But I will say that if you go get your cabling, especially pre-tipped, on uh, pretty much any online retailer, you're going to get some counterfeit lying about the gauge non-pure copper trash from China. And that is a fire waiting to happen. So go to the hardware store, see the pure copper in person, and have them cut it for you. It's usually like $1.50 a foot or something. Like, it's, it's really not that much. The only problem is usually they don't sell red and uh, black. So you might have to... Go get some red electrical tape or do something creative with uh, red paint. All right, wired it up, but it didn't exactly go as planned because it turns out that post is bigger than that one. The negative one, it fit just fine. The positive one, it didn't. Is that a thing? I, I am not familiar with that at all. So we've got the other quick disconnect system on here, and then uh, I was just too lazy to swap out the cables. So um, this does work. I tested it, lifted it up, and we've got, of course, a piece of wood to lift it up in case it gets warm. Uh, should be solid, so uh, let me zoom out and give you a little tour. So we've got two gauge cable and we've got about six feet of it, uh, maybe maybe a little bit less. That's just what came with it, so that's what we're doing. Am I going to cut it shorter after this video? Almost definitely, but those are securely connected there. Make sure that they're not uh, touching the chassis at all. Um, in fact, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if this was a little bit to the right. There we go, just keep it away from the chassis. And... Uh, you can see it just goes negative to negative, positive to positive. Yes, I will paint that or uh, wrap it in red electrical tape when I'm done. And then we just got the fuse. So if I were to touch those two together right now, that fuse would blow out in a couple seconds, cut the circuit off, and stop the cables from melting. Exactly what we need. So cabling connectors, uh, middle end inverter, and a battery, you're looking at under 300 bucks, I would say. If you really, really, really want to do it right, uh, maybe 400 So pretty good project price. Let's see if it works. So let's switch it on.
And with no fans running, it takes, uh, I believe, under 10 watts, it says, just to sit there idle and do nothing. So is my cutoff sufficient? Yes, it is. Wow, that's a lot of residual power in the capacitors. Holy cow. Now, because I just emptied the capacitors, we're going to get a spark when I uh, turn this back on because it's going to draw a whole bunch all at once while it uh, loads up the capacitors. And of course, I got that when I first hooked it up too because this has been sitting idle for, you know, like a month. So I'm going to be real careful with this one. Yeah, there it is. Heard that one. Uh, but now we're good. Not really dangerous if you see that. Doesn't mean you shorted it out or did anything wrong. Now all that's left to do is plug in the fridge. So you want to do it while it's off just for safety. All right, turn it back on there and uh, it is pulling absolutely nothing. So the refrigerator isn't running right now, but like I said, you want to test it? Open the door up. While we're waiting for it to actually get warm enough to kick in, uh, these do look like they're different sizes. Have I just never noticed that? Like, is that a thing? Have all cars been that way and I just didn't notice that? Well, <laughs> I guess the cutoff switch is going on the negative then, but we've got the fuse on the positive. I don't feel that bad about this setup. I might look for a better uh, disconnector switch, but honestly, looking on the internet, I couldn't find much for cheap. And the uh, quote-unquote quick disconnect system that you see with the little, uh, the little turning knob, that doesn't work the way you think it does. It would not work in this scenario. It wouldn't be fast enough. But I am definitely going to swap these in because uh, you get a little tighter fit that way. Oh, a fun little tip here. Uh, if your battery's running out of juice and you want to just give it a little bit of extra push, steal the battery out of your riding lawnmower. <laughs> there you go. Otherwise, yeah, these are like $40. They're significantly lower than these. You could run it on one of these solo, but uh, I believe in the last video, this ran for 15.3 hours and this ran for like two. <laughs> so pretty big difference. And this is also not a deep cycle. However, if you topped this one off, positive to positive, negative to negative, now you got them in parallel, so it, does, it wouldn't be 24 volts, it would just be extra push. And they should kind of level a little bit. Now there is going to be an enormous amount of power running between these. So if you had like a double zero gauge, a two gauge, or like a really, really thick cable and only ran it for a foot, it should be fine. Now you could just get like four of these batteries, but I mean, do you really need to run your fridge for 60 hours? Uh, and then you got to top them all off and all that. And if you leave them linked up to top them all off, they won't charge evenly. Then you need like a battery management system with a chip in it and it starts getting complicated. Oh, there it is. The refrigerator just kicked in. Let's take a look. All right. So I switched it over to Watts. It says it's pulling 80. Um, seems around to like the nearest 20, which I thought was a little weird, <laughs> but, um, 11.6, you know, under load, that's somewhat normal. I mean, if it was a really big beast of a battery or lithium, I'd expect it to still be like above 12, even with that compressor running, but uh, is what it is. So what you wanna do is after about a minute, see if anything is hot. All right, so not warm, not warm, not warm, not warm, not warm, not warm, and not warm. There you go. I would recheck that every minute for the first 10 minutes. If you make it past 10 minutes, it's probably good, but you know, check on it once in a while. So if you're like a professional electrician or you got any tips for how to build this better, I mean, other than the jank setup I've got right here that I'm about to fix as soon as I turn off the camera, uh, let me know. Any other little tips and tricks or money saving techniques or anything like that, let me know. And if you have a really good recommended brand of inverter that I forgot to mention other than Renault G and Victron, love to hear about it. Thanks for watching everybody. If you found this useful, leave a big old like on the video. The budget for this was outrageous and I'm never going to make the money back on it most likely, but I'm just out there telling people how to survive. So uh, if you like prepper electronic stuff, you're on the right channel, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.